Hello, welcome to Rappler Talk. I'm Marites Vitug, and we are going to talk about Vietnam's effective strategy to contain the coronavirus. And joining us from Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam is Professor Guy Thwaites. He's the director of the Oxford University Clinical Research Unit. As I said, in Ho Chi Minh City, he's also a professor of infectious diseases in the University of Oxford. Welcome to Rappler Talk, Professor Thwaites. And thank you. I, yeah, thank you for, for taking time. Now, you know, we're all fascinated, at least here in Southeast Asia, about Vietnam. How come they've been so successful? Of course, this morning I just read the news that from 288 confirmed cases, there, the number has risen to 312 because of the Vietnam repatriates. But mm. overall, they've been successful. Can you maybe explain to us what has been so effective about Vietnam's strategy? Yes, I can explain, I think. And I think the, I think the essence of their success has been the fact that they responded very, very quickly. So um, they were aware of the outbreak, like everyone else was in, uh, in uh, Wuhan City, in Hubei province in China, at the end of December. And they began to prepare as soon as they heard about the outbreak, just by uh, they recognized that this was a potential problem Vietnam shares uh, about a 1,500-kilometer border with China, so uh, it wasn't a great stretch of imagination to believe that the virus might come to Vietnam quite early on, and indeed it did. It came on January the 23rd, was the first case, and those were people traveling back from Wuhan itself. But no sooner as that happened, um, and that coincided with the Lunar New Year, as you probably know, um, so there was a, not a lot of people moving around at that point, but, and all of the schools and the universities were shut. But they shut the universities and the schools from that point onwards. And they actually only opened again uh, this week. Um, so they acted very, very quickly. I mean, the other thing that they did, which was very important, is that they, they were very, very careful in identifying cases and identifying the contacts of those cases and quarantining them. So over the last 100 days, they've probably quarantined upward of 200,000 people. Um, now, about 70,000 of those were in government quarantine facilities um, around the country, and the rest may have been quarantined inside their homes or other or hotels and so on. But nonetheless, that is an enormous effort to, to, to do that. And I think the, the speed in which they did it is the, is the reason why they've been successful. Were they, were, were they ready with quarantine centers or were these like schools or government buildings? Because they were able to mobilize so many quarantine centers in a, in a few days. Well, they very rapidly, very early on in January, identified the, uh, a number of centers that could be could serve as quarantine centers, and they opened them up. But many of them, uh, for example, were um, uh, so in in Ho Chi Minh City, for example, biggest city in the in the country, uh, north and south, there were two hospitals. Um, smaller kind of um, uh, provincial hospitals, which they adapted to, to have uh, to be quarantine and treatment centers. They were well outside the city, which made a lot of sense. So they were able to use facilities that already existed on the whole uh, to, to, um, uh, to quarantine those people. And who supervised these quarantine centers? I was tr I'm trying to imagine how these quarantine centers work, where there are doctors, military, you know, that very strict observance of a 14-day quarantine. Well, it was all coordinated by the Ministry of Health and through the Ministry of Health, um, the Centers for Disease Control, the CDC of Ho Chi Minh City and, and up in Hanoi, Hanoi, it was the uh, National Institute for Hygiene and Epidemiology. So, so on the whole, it was the health system that did this and it was the healthcare workers who work within that system who managed the, uh, the people contained within the quarantine centers. And you said earlier, it's an enormous effort to do contact tracing. How yes. How how were they able to do this? That's our problem here in the Philippines. We're starting late, but um, since Vietnam, of course, is a different structure, um, I read reports that they've mobilized. Did they mobilize the military and civilians to do contact tracing? Well, really, most of no, most of it was done by the um, the CDC, and so it was the healthcare workers and the public health officials who did it. Um, the military um, would, would generally have been used, but really around the border areas, not so much in the cities of and, 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 um, Hanoi and, and Ho Chi Minh City. No, it's been, it's been the public health systems that's, that, that have done this. And as you alluded to, in, in the Philippines, you probably have too many cases, but they, kept, they managed to keep the case numbers relatively well controlled. 
And so it was just about manageable. It was a stretch, I can tell you, right at the peak of, of, of the number, when the numbers of people were, you know, in, in excess of 50,000 or 100,000, that's a big effort, but they were still able to manage it. So the contact tracing was uh, done manually. There was no, te- was there use of technology? You know, like in Taiwan, they're very savvy with tech. So it was like people going and interviewing contacts. It was all quite um, old fashioned, if you like. <laughs> it's very, very good epidemiology. Um, simple stuff done very, very well. And subsequently, they have released apps and things like that. But actually, the majority of this effort has just been through um, good organization. And uh, apart from contact tracing, they also did tests early on, and they've done more tests than the Philippines uh, has done. And uh, they also increased the number of laboratories from three in January to 112 in April. How is this possible? We are we only have 30 laboratories here in the Philippines. Yeah, they increased the capacity really quite quickly. Um, they were, I mean, a lot of that's training people to, to do the tests, other, other labs are the central labs. So we were one of the early labs that were able to do the tests. Um, and uh, we uh, created an entire team here that was working pretty much sort of 14, 16 hours a day at one point, doing around 2,000 tests a day. Uh, but overall, the country's done, I think, uh, approaching 300,000 PCR tests. So that's the direct detection of the virus in specimens um, since, since it began. Yeah, it's been, it's been impressive, but it's lucky to have enough of an infrastructure across the country, enough laboratories that are that are just about capable of um, of, uh, of doing this. So Vietnam has invested in its healthcare system. I mean, to be able to to respond effectively, they have uh, poured in a lot of investments. Com- well, Vietnam, I mean, yeah. Vietnam is very used to dealing with infectious disease outbreaks. So if you if you go back to two thousand and two and SARS, um, yes. there were the first cases there outside of uh, Hong Kong. Uh, up in Hanoi, they managed to contain that. About 18 months later, you had bird flu. The first 10 cases were treated in this hospital in which I'm sitting at the moment. Um, and then subsequent to that, there's been big outbreaks of hand, foot and mouth disease, measles, dengue, and so on. So, so the country, I'm sure in a similar way to the Philippines actually, is very used to infectious diseases. It's, it's used to reasonably big outbreaks of infectious diseases. So it has the mechanisms and experience to be able to deal with them well. And um- did you train you earlier? You talked about uh, well-trained health workers in, in doing contact tracing. Did your uh, unit train a lot of these Vietnamese healthcare workers? So we um, we work in the hospitals um, and um, we work in the laboratories in the hospitals. So our training was very much around the diagnostics and then um, uh, in treatment. So we weren't we weren't particularly engaged in the in the in the training of um, the contact tracing and things like that. So that wasn't part of our role. That's a that's a role that is taken by the Vietnamese authorities and, and the, the Centers for Disease Control. And um, we were wondering here in the Philippines, it's hard to copy what Vietnam has done because they're able to mobilize quickly. And, and but what lessons can can we learn? I mean. Uh, from Vietnam as a neighbor, we could uh, easily learn from them. Well, I think the first lesson is the speed of response. Um, I think uh, that has been one of the uh, characteristics that's been most that's led to their success. And so I, I think every country can learn from that. I think there were a number of delays in other countries that have led to the difficulties. And, and we've seen that once the once the, the virus becomes well established in the community, Actually, it's really, really hard to do what Vietnam has done. Vietnam would not have been able to do what they've done unless they acted early. I think the other thing to say is that um, they had a they had a very good communication system uh, as well. So right from mid-January, the, uh, messages started to go out to all of the population. This is through SMS. There was quite a famous uh, uh, sort of pop video that went viral. Um, I don't know whether you saw it. Very funny kind of song, uh, teaching people about washing their hands and and the importance of hygiene to prevent the infection. So they had a very good system of communication, and I, and and that is certainly can be replicated by many countries that was able to um, educate and and um, prepare their population for what might happen into the future with this with this virus. 
So I think that's one of the that's one of the major lessons actually is, is good communication essential in in outbreak uh, situations. Is it you know we've been wondering that there has been no death at all in Vietnam. So is it credible? I mean, not a single person has died of COVID nineteen. Yeah, it is completely credible, and and the reason I can tell you that because I work in one of the big centres, the the, the the major treatment centre. And uh, we also have a, a, a unit in Hanoi that also works uh, alongside our, our, our major partners are the, the National Hospital for Tropical Diseases in Hanoi, where all of the cases went, and the Hospital for Tropical Diseases down in Ho Chi Minh City, where all of the other severe cases came when uh, if you have them, if you have if you're infected down in the south. And that uh, there, there have been no deaths. Um, I think the reason for it is um, uh, probably because a lot of the cases are quite young. So the, the median age of, of cases um, in Vietnam is 30 years old, uh, which is considerably long, younger than, um, than perhaps you would find in Europe or the UK, for example. Um, and we know very well that younger people tend to do uh, much better with this infection than older people. We have had severe cases. There's been uh, about 21 quite severe, severely unwell cases. Um, I can't remember the precise number ventilated, but certainly three of them have had to have um, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. This is the kind of very, very high tech technique to, to um, take people uh, off the ventilator and uh, and oxygenate their blood by a machine. Um, and that uh, so that's uh, that's happened in three cases. So they they had severe cases. But they've managed they've managed them well. And, uh, of course, a, a number of commentaries have said that uh, Vietnam can do it because they're a one party state. They're a mobilization society. So is that, that's, the, that's true, right? That's accurate? Um, well, it's true that there are one party states, but actually I don't, my, my personal opinion is that that doesn't, um, that's rather irrelevant for this response because actually what they did was they acted quickly and they acted in a coordinated way. Uh, they acted with very, very good communication across, across the population. And, and they placed simple, good epidemiology at the heart of their response. Now, I don't see any reason why any political system couldn't do that. The, the polit political systems that um, have, or, or, or healthcare systems that are more socialized, I appreciate it's probably a bit easier because you have uh, a homogenous system, if you like, across the country and you can press a button at the top of the country and everything else happens. But there's no reason, for example, that the United Kingdom couldn't do that. They have a completely socialized healthcare system it could have been possible to do the same. Vietnam has a, a socialized healthcare system and it managed to succeed. So I, I, I don't particularly buy into this idea that there's something unique about the Vietnamese political system. It's just uh, um, they were well organized. Yes, and going back to contact tracing, I was also amazed to read that they did not only, they did second-hand contact and third-hand contact. That's, that's yeah. quite extensive. I mean, is that normally done? Usually it's just the first circle of contacts. No, it's not normally done. And I think that Vietnam were unique in that, actually, chasing down down to F, well, F2 and F3. Yeah, they did. Um, I mean, on the whole, the, the, the first contacts were the only ones who were, who were quarantined in government facilities. Uh, but then the other contacts were asked to, to quarantine at home or sometimes they were asked to go to hotels. Um, but yeah, they, they, they went that far, which... Uh, and, and I think what we found um, is that that was a sensible thing to do because a very high proportion of these people have no symptoms. They have infection, but no symptoms. And therefore, if you if you don't do that, you risk a number of people just walking around completely well, transmitting the virus. And if that happens, then you can see that the, uh, the virus enters into the population and, and it can be very difficult to control. And what also surprised me was that the lockdown, a national lockdown, was only for 21 days. Yes. <laughs> no, I, I'm surprised because we're entering our ninth week of, of lockdown. So the lockdown was really not um, central in their strategy. No, in a way, it was the sort of finishing point, really, at least at this, at this particular stage. Um, but they felt that it was necessary, and I think they were right, because there was evidence of ongoing community transmission. There were little clusters appearing right the way up through to the end of March. And they, the, the lockdown, lockdown started right at the beginning of April, when there was still evidence of community transmission. Um, and they stopped, and, they, and that effectively stopped it. Um, 
and there hasn't been any case of community transmission as far as anyone is aware, and I believe it, uh, since April the 15th. Um, and that's why the lockdown was released on April the 23rd, because there was no evidence of ongoing trans uh, community transmission. Um, and as with every country, you, you know, everybody wanted to get back to some kind of um, normality. So uh, there was great relief when it came. So, but uh, not not the entire country is open. Uh, the the is entire the internally the country is is feels very close to normal now. Uh, the roads are very busy. Uh, <laughs> coffee shops are busy. Um, uh, people are going about their normal business. Um, the difference is that the, there is no connection internationally. The borders remain pretty much shut. Um, there are, as you alluded to right at the beginning of the interview, flights coming in, repatriating Vietnamese um, from other places, and they're all bringing back COVID, but they're all isolated. So the chances, I think, of people coming back in with COVID are high, but the chances of them actually escaping into the community and causing problems are low. And uh, offices have uh, opened up. Did, was there a mass testing of employees before they returned to their work? No. Oh. no. There was no need to do that, actually, because they were confident that, that they'd had all of, they, they knew where all the cases were. So uh, effectively, there's no more community transmission? No, there hasn't been any community transmission that anyone knows about since April the 15th. And, and at the moment, I think that's the case. Um, I think that the real difficulty going into the future is that there will be quite a lot of cases coming back. They will quarantine them all. But it's still, you know, it's, it's not infeasible to imagine that somehow someone crosses a border because the, the borders with Cambodia and Laos and China are all, you know, quite, they're quite uh, long and difficult to police. And it's not, it's, it's, you can imagine that, 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 that keeping that uh, completely secure is going to be very difficult. And anyway, if, if, if there's uh, like infection, infected people who come in, like in the case of the repatriated Vietnamese, as you said, they already know what to do. They, they have this uh, system and people are confident that uh, it will not uh, affect the rest of the population. Yeah, they are confident at the moment and I think they're right to be. Okay, so you work, you report to work every day. You've been reporting to work even during the uh, lockdown? No, in the lockdown, I spent, I would come perhaps one or two days a week because um, I wanted to, to um, be responsible within the lockdown. Uh, but also I needed to, I wanted to come to the hospital because we help with the response. And I needed to talk to the hospital director and the doctors and, um, and uh, make sure that we were providing the right level of support for the hospital and for the government, which is part of the reason why we're here. Thank you very much, Professor Guythwaite. It was very... Uh, informative and uh, I'm, I'm addressing my viewer, our viewers, that we will continue to talk about other countries' uh, best practices and how they were able to contain the, the virus. Thank you again, Professor Thwaites, and we will keep in touch. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much.